This is Bob Letterer. Contrary to the U.S. government's claims that its democratic governance system means that it does not hold political prisoners, in fact, for many decades, its prisons have been filled with activists held because of their radical political beliefs and actions. Today, it's estimated that there are at least 100 people in prison from a broad range of movements in this country. Only a few of them have been gay men and lesbians. So I'm especially honored to be speaking today with a former political prisoner who is openly gay. Ricardo Jimenez is a courageous, lifelong activist for the independence of his homeland, Puerto Rico, from the United States. He was one of a dozen independence fighters convicted in the 1980s of, quote, seditious conspiracy, unquote. That is an alleged conspiracy to bring about the overthrow of the U.S. government because of his membership in a clandestine pro-independence organization called La Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional, FALN, where the initials were Armed Forces of National Liberation. Based in the U.S. mainland, the FALN carried out over 100 politically motivated bombings of headquarters of U.S. corporations with investments in Puerto Rico and offices of U.S. military organizations and law enforcement agencies involved in repression in Puerto Rico and other such buildings throughout the 1970s and 80s as acts of resistance against U.S. colonialism. Sentenced to 98 years in prison, he served 19 years, 19 and a half years actually, all of it in maximum security until granted clemency and release by President Bill Clinton in 1999, along with 10 other Puerto Rican political prisoners following a broad-based international support campaign. Upon his re release, Ricardo moved to Puerto Rico. In 2008, he then moved to Chicago, where he now works as an HIV-AIDS counselor for the Latino HIV-AIDS support agency called Vida Sida, which is a project of the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. He's also active in the movement for the full funding of Latino-focused HIV intervention and prevention, and also for LGBTQ rights. He is currently co-coordinator of the National Boricua Human Rights Network, which campaigns for the freedom of the two remaining political prisoners, one of whom, Oscar Lopez Rivera, was Ricardo's early mentor and a dear friend. Ricardo is here in New York as part of a speaking tour to build support for that campaign. Tonight, in part one of this two-part interview, we're going to be talking with Ricardo about why he has devoted his life to this struggle, what is the history of U.S. government repression of the Puerto Rican independence movement, and what his experiences were in prison. In part two, to be broadcast at a later date, we will discuss his work as an independentista and how that relates to his being a gay man. Um, he'll He'll talk about the advances that have been made in the struggle for LGBT rights, both in the Puerto Rican independence movement and the broader Puerto Rican population. Ricardo, thanks for joining us on Out FM. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Bob. It's really a pleasure to be able to see you uh, here today and in, uh, in my tour here in New York. And it's a great honor, and I would like to publicly thank you uh, for all your devotion and, and dedication to the Puerto Rican independence movement and particularly to the Puerto Rican political prisoners which you have been with us for more than 30 years. Thanks so much. Well, let me start by asking you to tell us your story. Um, you got involved in the Puerto Rican independence movement as a teenager and um, it's, a, it's a really fascinating story about how you got involved and what the first projects you you were involved in and kind of what your path w went towards from there sure um i was born in puerto rico in san sebastian puerto rico and the first time i came to the united states with my parents was i was 30 days old uh, i eventually uh i eventually uh i stayed in uh in the united states and we uh my parents settled in chicago illinois where i continue where i had my edu formal education i went to grammar school high school and university in Chicago. Uh, one of the things, aspects that I always remember me, uh, remember when I was young is that 
um, I knew that I was different. I come and I grew up in a very traditional Puerto Rican family. Uh, my mother was an avid dancer, in which I became one also. Uh, we had uh, food. My food was, of course, always Puerto Rican. Uh, there was also uh, our traditional holidays. They were done in very Puerto Rican style. And therefore, I knew that I was different compared to other uh, kids around, with the exception of other Puerto Ricans. I knew that I was different. There was always a flag of the Puerto, of Puerto Rico in my home. I knew that I was Puerto Rican, but I didn't know who, what it was to be Puerto Rican. What is a Puerto Rican? It was until 1971 when I was first introduced to Puerto Rican history by a professor named uh, Dr. Jose, uh, who now is Dr. Jose Lopez. But at that particular time, I was his first student. He was doing student teaching. It is at this time that I realized that I had a glorious history. There was famous men and women in Puerto Rico, famous writers, painters, uh, uh, that uh, are were Puerto Rican, and this is a moment that I understood who I was in Puerto R uh, as a Puerto Rican. My thirst for knowledge continued. Where I read more books, and I eventually found out the, situ the political situation of Puerto Rico, uh, and uh, was introduced then at, at that time uh, to. Uh, the nationalist prisoners who had been in prisons from 1950, one group and another one, well, one person, Oscar Collazo, and 1954, uh, when Lolita Lebron, our national airman, led the attack on Congress in order to protest that Puerto Rico is still a colonial possession of the United States. Uh, so I, my, mostly uh, it is that those things that, uh, uh, that I, it comes to my mind that uh, made me know that the situation of Puerto Rico needed a solution. And I continued to work steadfast uh, for their release and participate in the independence movement. Simultaneously, simultaneously, I also work in the community. Um, and in this particular time, I started working in housing, and I started working in uh, education. Uh, I started working in the drug situation in, 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 in the Puerto Rican neighborhood. During this time, and I was about maybe 15 years old, doing a project for my Puerto Rican history class, uh, I met uh, Oscar Lopez Rivera. Uh, it is this the first time that I met him was I was about 14 and a half years old. He was 28. It was him who introduced me furthermore what it is to struggle for human rights. What is this to struggle for a better community that we wanted to establish? And he became to be one of the, my greatest mentor in my life. Uh, we continue working together. I continue my dedication to the independence movement and, and um, my participation for the Free the, the Five Naturalists would eventually happen in 1979 when they were freed from an executive clemency from President Carter. Uh, it is at this point that uh, uh, about a half a year later is when I was incarcerated for my involvement in the Puerto Rican independence movement on April 4, 1980. Well, Jimenez, you were arrested in 1980 and charged with being a member of the FALN, as I mentioned before. And for those listeners who may be shocked at the idea of an armed guerrilla movement operating inside the United States, um, as the FALN was, can you explain to us some of the historical context, the fact that, um, that there is a long history of both armed and nonviolent resistance to colonialism in Puerto Rico, first under Spanish rule and then when the U.S. invaded in 1898, and then also in the more recent period, the um, resolutions and, and actual um, official legal protocols adopted by the United Nations that authorize the use of armed tactics um, by those who are resisting colonial domination. Oh, I think we have to look, when we look at the situation of Puerto Rico, we have to look at it in a historical context. Uh, we were uh, a colony of Spain for 400 years. And during that time, it says particularly in the 1800s, it was a very strong movement for our independence. Like all other nations and, uh, of the mother country from uh, an independence movement from the mother country from Spain and Latin America, there was also a movement for their independence. Uh, Puerto Rico, of course, was uh, uh, tried to achieve its independence. Particularly, we can uh, look at 1868 and Grito de Lares, which is a very significant point in Puerto Rican history because uh, the creation of the conscience of the Puerto Rican nation is born in 1868. No longer do people who live in Puerto Rico see themselves as Spaniards, as Africans, or natives, if not 
Puerto Ricans. And it's that conscience that is born and developed from 1868 and continues to uh, develop and strive to eventually we, in 1897, where we are granted a charter of autonomy from Spain. In the charter of autonomy, we develop our citizenship, we have our postal system, we have our banking system, and everything starts to come in control in our hands, in the hands of the Puerto Rican nation. Uh, simultaneously, the charter was not allowed to be uh, altered in no way without the consent of the Puerto Rican nation. During that time, also, Spain had just finished the Spanish-American War. Uh, I mean, that has finished a war, and the United States wanting to uh, become the world power declare a war on Spain. Uh, of course, they won immediately. The uh, United States became the world power, and, uh, and Spain gave to the uh, United States uh, Cuba, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. And particularly Puerto Rico was illegal because we had a charter of autonomy. Upon uh, we learning that we were ceded to the United States, uh, the Puerto Rican nation opposed. Uh, eventually, on July 25th, 1898, without the consent of the Puerto Rican nation, uh, Puerto Rico was invaded. And when they were invaded, martial law was established in Puerto Rico to the point that fear was created in the nation of Puerto Rico where every citizen had to be stayed in ho at their homes in the evening because martial law declared that after five or six in the evening, no one can be out in the streets. This continued for two years. After that, we had the situation of organic, call, organic laws uh, uh, passed. And one of the most uh, interesting one is the uh, Jones Act of 1917. In 1917, the Puerto Rican nation was imposed American citizenship against their will. The legislature that represented Puerto Rico at that particular time voted zero not to accept and do not want, did not want American citizenship. 30 days later, United States uh, passed the Jones Act and forcefully made us American citizens. And uh, 30 days later, uh, we were uh, 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 drafted to become part of the night of the World War I. Ever since then, Puerto Rico has uh, been has had to uh, uh, been part and participate and drafted in World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf, and today, presently, any situation that arises, there are conflicts that brought the United States involved. We have to be there. Uh, knowing that this had happened, you know, the government and uh, uh, Puerto Rico at that time, per cer certain persons took the situation to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court stated. Clearly, it's not part of the United States, but belongs to the United States as a piece of property. And therefore, just as I have this hat on, and, and, and it's my hat, I do as I please with it. When I take it off, I can take it off. I can put it on, and when I don't want to wear it, I put it away. Or if I don't want it at all, I can throw it away. And that's the relationship that Puerto Rico has had to the United States, a classical colony where the economic, social, and political uh, circumstances of Puerto Rico is controlled by the United States. This, of course, uh, being against the will of the Puerto Rican nation. The Puerto Rican nation has completely fought since they first started, since the Puerto Rico was first invaded. And if we look historically, we had uh, the movement of Aguila Blanca in the 1900s after 1898 that was an armed struggle to get United States uh, out of, of Puerto Rico after they invaded us. If we continue, continue, uh, if we continue in his uh, historical account, in the 19, uh, early 1920s, there was a vast movement of a nationalist movement that, that, that surged in Puerto Rico for our independence. And then at that time, one of the greatest Puerto Ricans that have lived, Don Pedro Alviso Campos, uh, took the leadership of the nationalist party and took it to a whole new level. It is that moment when, move, when the movement was at its prime, that people were uh, being aware of the situation of Puerto Rico, that the United States decided uh, to repress the movement and had uh, Don Pedro Alviso Campos along with Juan Antonio Corregel, who was the national, the national poet and one of the commanders of the movement, were arrested. Uh, the whole leadership of the nationalist movement was arrested and charged with seditious conspiracy. Seditious conspiracy, as you had, as Bob had mentioned, was the charge that I was given, and it's the charge that has, uh, comes about and has its, its, its roots in the Civil War 
uh, during the time that when the North and the South were uh, uh, fighting, then if anybody would pass the line of the North or the South, they'd be seditious. But Puerto Ricans cannot be seditious, as Don, Don Juan Antonio Corajel would say, because I just mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, the Supreme Court says that Puerto Rico is not part of the United States, but belongs to the United States. So how can a country that is not part of a nation be seditious? The impossible crime is called in Puerto Rico, but that has been the charge that they have been using in 1936 against the leadership of the Nationalist Party. Again, we saw the situation arise again in 1950 when we had the revolution of Hajuja that established the first republic of Puerto Rico in the town of Hajuja and the Puerto Rican uh, 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 flag was raised. Uh, right thereafter thousands were incarcerated and some were charged with seditious conspiracy. Again we see seditious conspiracy come about in the 1954 uh, when Loita Lebron led the attack on Congress. And this, these actions were, were taken because uh, Loli, the Nationalist Party wanted to make sure that the world knew that Puerto Rico is a colony. Uh, and this was seen at that time, the League of Nations, which today is the United Nations, had Puerto Rico on the, on the uh, colonial possessions of the world. And the United States trying to get the name, uh, their name off the list uh, passed public law 600 and 600 is very law public law 600 establishes la ela which is estado libre asociado translated is the commonwealth estado libre asociado is it's an impossibility but if i translate it for you it means that it's that puerto rico is a state that it's free and associated three terms in contradiction of each other in conflict of each other so how can a country be free liberated and associated it's an it, it, it is one of the situations and we see it is then uh this continued on to the 1980s uh, when uh, and conflicts in Puerto Rico continue, but the armed struggle uh, uh, revived itself. In the 1960s, the Comandos Revolucionarios de, del Pueblo come about, but they are clandestine. They're clandestine because they learned from the Nationalist Party that if they do public activities or public support, they will be repressed by the United States. And that comes about when the Comandos Revolucionarios del Pueblo come about, as the leader is Filiberto Rios. Uh, um, Ojeda Rios. In 1980, uh, knowing that we are still a colony and that we have the right to seek our independence based on international law, because international law clearly states that colonialism is a crime of humanity against humanity and any country that seeks itself that sees itself as a colonial possession has the right to seek its independence in any way they see necessary including the armed struggle and knowing that we are part of part of latin america and we are wanted to achieve our independence we had the right to fight for our country the way we see and in the 1960s and 70s you see the surgeons of the clandestine movement in puerto rico uh, to uh, make protests and have arms, arm actions against the United States for their presence in maintaining Puerto Rico a colonial possession. It is these actions that in 1980, uh, 11 of us are arrested on April 4, 1980 for participating in the arm actions against the United States because of our colonial position. You're arrested in 1980. You're, um, you're tried and convicted of seditious conspiracy and other charges. Um, in your case, you got uh, the, the highest sentence of any of your comrades, 98 years, and you're thrown into maximum security. So tell us, you know, on a more personal level, what was that like? You ended up serving 19 of those years before you were released, um, and you went to a variety of different prisons around the United States. What was it like? How did you handle being in prison for 19 years, and, and also in particular as a, a part of answering that, as a gay man, I know that you made the, the self-protective decision to become closeted in prison. So what was that like, and what did you observe about the treatment of gay men in the prison, openly gay men, and just generally give us kind of that, that whole experience. 1980, at the age of 23, I enter uh, prisons of the United States. Uh, of course, I was very young, and I looked very young, so I knew that and somehow I was going to be uh, maybe harassed or anything in that situation. But uh, I went in with a lot of people knowing who I was. Uh, 
uh, because of, of, the, of the notary of the case and the publicity of the case. People knew of the, uh, of the people who were accused of bombings of the FAON, supported these were the people who were going to prison. Uh, of course, it was a shock, uh, but I think if you look historically, anybody that uh, participates in the highest expression of the Puerto Rican independence movement, which was the armed struggle in that time, the only two things that you know that eventually will happen to you, and most Puerto Ricans that are in, uh, from the independence movement, either you go to prison for the rest of your life or you'll be uh, killed. And unfortunately, well, I wound up in prison. And I knew that I was going to be in prison for a long time, and it subconsciously is what we all knew would happen in one day or another, suppose, on the, until we were victorious. Uh, I think the human being has the ability, especially uh, people who are from the independence movement, to adopt. Uh, we know that we are there for the love of our country, that we represent a movement, and therefore uh, our time probably would have been it's much, much better because consciously and mentally we know that we made a conscious uh, uh, defending uh, the Puerto Rican independence movement and, and defending our country. Now, going in prison and knowing that, that, that I, I, I was gay, uh, I made a very conscious decision that uh, when I look at the surroundings of, the, of how gays were treated in the, in the prison, uh, I knew that this would have presented an, an incredibly high problem for me and maybe for my comrades. And out of security, uh, I did not sexually know, sexually, uh, my sexuality was not expressed while I was in prison. Everybody thought that I was uh, straight and I maintained a straight character during my 20, almost 20 years in prison. Uh, but I also got the chance to see how the gay community uh, is treated and how uh, human beings were treated uh, in a prison where they are exploited uh, and where they are used, uh, where they are not treated in a humane way. And I think uh, some of the gays that went there, well, they stood up to a lot of the uh, atrocities that would happen. But others caught themselves in being, uh, for other lack of words, a slave to a lot of the prisoners there. Uh, they were treated in such inhumane con uh, the, uh, uh, situations where uh, they were sold like if they were sold in a sla uh, in, a, in in like if they were slaves. They were uh, forced to do sexual acts against other prisoners, uh, and uh, they were not treated too well. Uh, and so I think that sort of things that uh, prison has, you know, that the decadence of some of the things that happen in prison uh, is shown in the reality of how gays. Are, are are treated. Um, it is in that in that manner that when the whole hysteria of HIV uh, came out in 1980s and the treatment that they was given to uh, to gays in that particular time, thinking that every 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 gay had HIV, that I developed uh, in the the first HIV education uh, seminars in the. Uh, in the United States Penitentiary in Lewisburg, and which enlightened and uh, made the uh, the acceptance of treating uh, gays in a much more humane manner. Um, before before we end this segment, I just wanted you to very briefly, in in about one minute, um, tell us about uh, the, the two political prisoners that still remain after you were released in 1999, along with ten of your comrades and. Several other people have been released in the intervening years, and now that leaves two. Um, very quickly, tell us about Oscar Lopez Rivera and Avelino Claudio Gonzalez, and then give us contact information for people who want to get involved in the campaign to free them. Avelino Claudio Gonzalez, uh, who is now almost about a little over three years in prison, he has a seven-year sentence. Uh, is still uh, is one of the uh, one of the prisoners that we are very concerned about because of his medical condition. He suffers from Parkinson's disease, and the United States uh, our Bureau of Prisons has treated inhumanely in the sense that they has not had the proper medical treatment. It took a very big struggle. Uh, to have the medication given to him, the proper medication given to him. It's not fully uh, administered, uh, and now he is in a medical center. In the case of Oscar Lopez Rivera, on January 5, 2011, uh, he went before the uh, uh, United States Parole Commission in what was uh, classified, uh, 
kangaroo court uh, uh, because of evidence that was brought upon him that he had nothing to do of, uh, of that he was never accused of. He was given uh, a continuation of 15 years of expiration uh, uh, on, of his sentence, which means that Oscar, at the age of 68 years old, has to do 12 more years will make him uh, 80 years old upon his release. And this is on top of the 30 that years that he's already served. Yes, there will be a total of 42 years that he will be in prison of his stance right now. And for those who want to get active in the campaign, there's a petition, there's educational events, there's various activities going on. So where can they plug into all this? Uh, you can go in, in, into uh, a website that's called National Boricua Human Rights. We have chapters in Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and New York. And if you want to have contact, you can go into uh, Boricua, B-O-R-I-C-U-A, H-U-M-A-N-R-I-G-H-T-S dot O-R-G, and you can get information from one of the locations that's closest to you. And we want to thank our guest, Ricardo Jimenez, uh, openly gay, Puerto Rican, former political prisoner, independence fighter. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. And we will be continuing this interview on a future program. Part two will cover um, some of your more recent work since your release on the issues of HIV AIDS and on LGBT rights and, and other issues in Chicago and also um, looking at the, the progress that's been made in breaking down barriers of homophobia within the Puerto Rican community here in the U.S. So, um, again, thank you very much for that, and we hope listeners will tune in for that second part of this interview. This is Bob Letterer. I'm